Trial Lawyers University, where the Titans come to train. Produced and powered by Law Pods. All right, well, we're here with my good friend, Dirk Vandiver. Dirk's from, you know, his place in Missouri. And uh, Dirk and I was just hanging out last, you know, last week in Huntington Beach, California at Travelers University. So, Dirk, let me ask you, what was your, what were the highlights of TLU Beach 2024 for you? I know you don't want me to say this, but your shocking uh, blonde hair was a highlight. Truly, though, it was going back to the same setting, right, overlooking the Pacific and probably enjoying it as much, the setting, as I did the year before. And then in terms of actual programs, many were terrific. I personally uh, thought the artificial intelligence was extraordinary. And I'm telling you, given my age, this is a little surprising, I use artificial intelligence multiple times every single day. And I learned a new one at Huntington Beach that I'd never even heard of before. What was that? Perplexity. And let me just tell you, for anybody that's looking for something where you can get, and I deal with complex technical issues, at least in some of the cases. For anybody that has cases like that, invest $200, get the pro version, you, it creates little bitty case summaries of specifically what you're looking at. It, it's extraordinary. And without having been there, I never would have, I don't believe I would have ever heard of perplexity. All right. Well, how about, how about the great food that was served every day, Dirk, and the, and the food trucks and the four hey. lecture tracks and the eight workshop tracks? How about all, all that, Dirk? That. All, all that, that too. That. All yes. right. Well, I know most people missed it. Baby was there and knows how awesome it was. But the great news is that we have rent, we have contracted out the entire hotel, the Pasea, next June 4th through 7th. So we're going to run TLU Huntington Beach version 4, 2025 then. And so I'm pretty stoked about that. I'm in the process of building it now. But the first thing we have to build before that is Caesar's Palace in Las Vegas. And that's going to be October 16th through 19th. And Dirk is going to be there. And he's been there. I think you were at twenty. You were at twenty two and twenty twenty one, right? We yep. took last year's off and went to New York, but you were in trial, so you couldn't join us. Yep. But we're gonna have to make Vegas and work. It's a little bit easier to do things in Vegas than in New York, believe it or not. A little bit easier and a little bit easier for people to get to, and much more affordable because New York is nuts when it comes to prices and money. Let me just tell you that. But we won't yep. deal with that anymore. So, Dirk, you've been a lawyer now some fifty years. I think you got an anniversary coming up, and that's amazing to me. That, you know, because so many people talk about, oh, if I hit this case, I'll, I'm going to retire. I'm going to do something else. If I do this, I'm looking forward to the days when I don't have all this work to do. But that's not you in any way, shape, or form. And which is, you know, which is always impressive slash inspirational. But Dirk, you weren't always a lawyer. So tell us, when did this big idea to become a lawyer get into your head as a young man? It came to me probably when I was in kindergarten. You see, I have a mother who was a lawyer, a father who was a trial lawyer. My great, my grandfather, I have a big picture in my exercise room, whereas the district attorney for the state of Illinois, he's standing on top of bootlegged liquor that he had confiscated. So I'm not really sure that I knew that there was any other path other than being a lawyer. You know, my dad and two of my brothers and my sister, and my uncle were all lawyers. And it was just like, why would I, why would I do something else? Of course, I'm going to be a lawyer. I was born to be a lawyer. Of course, right. I still got a lot of work to do to become the lawyer. I'm, I'm working on becoming, but it's a process. And so you got this idea as a young, young man. And then what, what in your life kind of really solidified your track to, to, to really buy into this lawyering thing? Well, for one thing, my father was a trial lawyer. My mother, who was a double major, a master's, a PhD, and a lawyer, had been in school the entire time. So she's there having never worked truly outside of school. The three of us, the three boys are there. And I thought that it was normal, common for 
a lawyer to go into court twice a month, at least. Sometimes when he didn't go to court in a month, I'd say, what is going on? That The work must be drying up. So I didn't know what a trial lawyer was as opposed to some other lawyer. But I knew this. I am the ultimate ham. I love to be in front of people. I love to be on stages. And so I went into my dad one time shortly before I graduated from high school. And I said, Dad, great news. My drama coach, because I did, I not only did the football, but I did all of the plays, the operettas, every single assembly. I was up there in, a, in front of a 1500 uh, seat auditorium. I said, great news. I have a half scholarship to Pasadena Playhouse where Gene Hackman and Dustin Hoffman went. Great news. I'm, I'm, I'm going there. And he said, I've got even better news. No, you're not. You're not going to go there and become an actor where that's apparently what you think you're going to do. You're not. And I don't even want you to be a lawyer. But if you're going to go to college, what you're going to do is you're not going to go to high school twice. You got to do something that if you don't become a lawyer, uh, you can fall back on. And I got good grades, but I hated accounting. And that's what I did because he said, if I'm paying, you're going to accounting. And then when I graduated from college, I already was in, in, uh, uh, enrolled at, at the University of Missouri Columbia where I had partied for many, many a year. And my dad is killed weeks before I'm going into law school. So hold on a second. Your, your dad, your dad was killed before law. So how, how did that happen? Okay. So my father, uh, who was always an industrious sort, bought a drill and literally the paper was spread out where he did exactly what the drills instructions told him to do. He grabbed the, the, uh, the drill. He grabbed a light source. It made a circuit through him and he was electrocuted. Killed at age 50, perfect physical specimen, leaving a wife who, of course, had never made any money, and three sons who were all in school and had never made money either. So how did that experience affect you? As you might expect, profoundly. I bet. Um, one thing that occurred, because it was a clear case uh, of liability against the manufacturer for this defective product. Missouri at the time had a $25,000 cap on human life. And I don't mean $25,000 not economic. I mean a $25,000 limit on anybody's death. So here's a man, 50, perfect health, going to make millions of dollars, th uh, three children and a wife, and it's worth 25000 My Mother contracted with really good lawyers. Uh, they realized that they were going to spend more money than we would actually collect, and so they settled for 12500 half of which goes to them. And my mother, for her 50-year-old husband, $6,250. And as you can imagine, that has put a burr under my saddle that has got me lit up every time I think about caps and about the inequities that still exist. So you go to law school at Missouri and you eventually graduate. So tell us from the time you get your bar card to the time to where you are today sitting on this podcast, tell us about that journey. It, it was an extraordinary journey. First of all, two or three weeks before when he died, I was already at MU, knowing that he would pay for everything. But MU... Um, wasn't I didn't even apply for any type of scholarships. So I had no money, and my mother had no money. And of course, my two younger brothers had no money. So there was no money. There was no money to go into law school. So what I did two to three weeks before law school was I started scurrying around and looking for law schools that still had merit scholarships open. I got one at UMKC, University of Missouri, Kansas City. And so I moved from law school at Columbia into Kansas City, moved in with my mother. 
Here I've been partying down at MU and fraternity, all of that. Now I'm living with my mother with zero money whatsoever. Because as great as he was of, of a lawyer and as much money as he uh, made, shocker, he spent it all, just like yours truly. So I went through that process at UMKC. I, I got through in two and a half years with some extra credit. And then I went into the Popham Law Firm. Popham Law Firm in 19, I, I think I graduated in the winter of uh, 1974. So it'll be 50 years coming up in terms of when I got that. I then went to, uh, to Popham and I've been there ever since. So you spent, so at the Popham Law Firm, is there anybody named Popham still alive that is uh, at the firm? Uh, no. I, I apologize for this war story, but you'll you'll like this war story. The name was uh, the name of the firm is Arthur po or Popham Arthur Popham Arthur Popham originally was in Kentucky, comes here in Kansas. He was a legendary trial lawyer. He would be able to get money uh, from people for the for the all justifiable but extremely significant awards. Then he comes up uh, to a trial where the only injury is a little boy has a little bitty, you can't, you can just barely see it, but a little bitty scar. So I said, how could you make that into something significant? And so that became the trial that Arthur Popham had that just demonstrated the value of a smile. And the value of a smile, it turns out, was quite significant, at least for the time. And that was published widely in magazines everywhere. So th that man was dead long before I got there. We, we celebrated our 100th anniversary a few years back at the Potton Law Firm. Wow, that's a lot of history in, in Missouri. It in is. In Missouri. All right, so now we're going to start, we're going to move on to TLU Vegas 2024, which is October 16th through 19th at Caesars Palace. And so right. what will you be teaching? Because just for full disclosure, I know a lot of folks around this country and I know a lot of trial lawyers, but there's very few that I've come across that are as dedicated to the craft, dedicated to learning this skill and, and dedicated to teaching the skills and the strategies of, of, of trial lawyering as Dirk Vandiver. And that's why, you know, I always consider it such a, a blessing and a treasure that you come to, you know, trial lawyers university and teach because you have such a wealth of knowledge and experience that, and you know, it's like my job is to go around the country is one of them is to find the great trial lawyers and bring them together so that they can share their collective wisdom with all of us who are struggling to figure this thing out and, and improve our crafts and, you know, improve our results because winning is awesome and losing sucks. I don't care, you know, how else, you can't put it any other way. It's like, oh, you tried, no. you did, you give it your best. It's like, nobody cares. They care if you win or if you lose. Giving your best is not what it's about. So in Vegas, what are you going to be teaching? What, what topics and concepts have you decided that this is the year for them? I believe that there are two different ones, and I'll probably do both if, if we have time to do that. Oh, One we got time. Is, Perfect. We we got what? nine lex not eight eight lecture tracks and twenty one workshop tracks. Dirk, we got time. We're gonna have you, so you've much got content there that it's gonna blow people away. I guarantee. Uh, like, it. go on. Yeah, like, oh, they, they, uh, many of the participants come up to me afterwards saying this is a little bit like uh, drinking out of a fire hose, and I said that's not a problem. All you right. need to do is join TLU, and then you can go ahead and you can listen to it while you're working out. Two different things that I want to uh, try. First of all, wrongful death. One of the great trial lawyers, in, uh, one of the first inner circle people, came up to me one time and said, you know, the, the, the case that always throws me is a wrongful death case. And I said, well, why? That's the greatest possible harm that could befall any human being. And he said, because it's blood money. You can say that it's not. But there's going to be people on that jury that are going to say, this is blood money. The money doesn't bring anybody back. Everybody dies. And now here you are, and you don't even contend or even suggest 
that you had some type of financial dependence on this individual and you want, at the time, millions of dollars for that, I don't buy it. More so than saying to somebody who is injured, I need help. I need help to get on with my life. Sorry, but 100% of us are going to have to deal with this. And so uh, 100% of the trials that I have with wrongful death confront that. This is a very unique type of lawsuit. And yes, you've, you've heard from all of the great trial lawyers at TLU various tracks where they bring in wrongful death. What I'm suggesting is that we have a track on wrongful death, or at least the type that I have, because it, in, it incorporates different ideas in every single thing that we do. It, it deals with jury selection. It deals before that with motions and lemony. It deals with jury selection, opening statement, direct, cross, close, the whole thing. You can have a tilt on and I'll share one thing, and maybe we'll have time, maybe we won't, to get to a couple of wrongful death cases I tried last year. One of the things that I see in people that I really respect is they talk about a wrongful death case or a cause of action. If you, for example, were representing four people in a single vehicle that were in a crash, you'd probably say, I represent four people that were hurt in this car wreck. But for whatever reason, that's not our mindset in wrongful death. In wrongful death, we say it's a single action when it's not. What it is, is there are four people here, four different people with unique relationships to this individual. And we're going to talk about the value of that comfort and of that society, which each one of these unique individuals have those had with this very unique person that they called mom or wife or whatever. So I, I, I think it really merits some intense evaluation and I'm looking forward to it. Well, the you did try... thing... go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, no. I was going to, what's the second thing you're going to teach about? Because I was going to talk, I want to ask you about the couple of trials you did last year and how you went about putting them together and getting the results you did. Right. The second thing that I'm going to do uh, arises, frankly, from a somewhat disappointing evaluation, self-evaluation that I did at this Huntington Beach. I just, it was seven days ago today that I did it, and I called it Vandiver's Manifesto. Th that name came from a book called Checklist Manifesto. I said, well, I can't put checklist in the, the, the title. That sounds too formulaic. Uh, and yet, that's what it is. It's a checklist. It's a specific step-by-step -step analysis as to how you get, and here's the point, you get specific, catchy, already believed slogans, taglines, whatever you want to say for your case. Here, here was my thesis. When I think about what is my theme, what is my frame, what am I really trying to connect with the jury about? I normally don't really sit down and, and write it out like I do, for example, with cross-examination of a, of a defense expert or opening or closing. I don't do it. I'm in, the, I'm in the gym working out, listening to TLU, and I hear somebody, as an example, this is something we talked about, Dan. I hear somebody telling me, that the theme of their case was time is brain. And it just, it just blew me away because when I, at the time that I was listening to that, I had a stroke case and a stroke case means a stroke is just like a stroke is a brain attack. Just like no blood to the heart is a heart attack. Well, if you have the blood flow interrupted so that you're not feeding the brain at some point within a few minutes, that brain is going to die. And so what was his uh, tagline? What was his theme? What was his frame? Time is brain. Would you agree, doctor, that time is of the essence when the blood flow is interrupted to the brain, to the heart, to the muscle? Absolutely. You've heard the expression, time is brain? Absolutely. What does that mean? Those are the types of things that I'm going to 
uh, place in 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 a what I would call Dan a a deficit in my law library. I have all the books, and all of those books have a few little sayings and slogans, and you everybody's heard Keith Mitnick talk about these phrases. But I don't know of any trial lawyer quote book. I know of quote books in general. I know of books by lawyers that give slogans and sayings of that. But we don't have anything where we want to say, what did this doctor not do? What was his job and what didn't he do? And then go to J, boom, there's 20 different things that you can say about the doctor's job. It's a book of quotes. But it's a book of quotes, and already I'm up to about a thousand of them, that every single one of you have heard about. Why is that so powerful? The things that I have in my book, I don't have a book, but the things that I have in this collection. And the reason is really simple. When I say a job undone is a, it is a not a job well done. When I say if you start a job, you've got to finish it. When I say things like that, you've already vaguely heard about that. It's not me, a lawyer, that's telling you this. It's your coach. Yeah, I remember my coach saying, you know, the very person who always complains and makes excuses, probably the person dropped the ball to begin with, or Benjamin Franklin. He who is good at making excuses probably doesn't have very much to do in terms of anything else. You've heard it. You believe it. Now I'm going to put a compilation together of it so that people can share this and take away from TLU something that's tangible. Again, I'll bet I have a thousand of these. In the one week since I have been out of TLU, my TLU presentation, I've probably added another hundred, and it just keeps going on. In fact, yesterday, Dan, I was talking with, you know, John Turner, terrific trial lawyer. I'm trying a case in two weeks where my guy is running toward a van, running toward a van that's coming down. They, as you might expect, are talking about uh, comparative fault. And John says, remember what Cardoza said? I said, what's that? Danger invites rescue. Because in that case, he was running toward the van because he thought that's where his son was. So that's the type of thing that I'm going to do, and I'm going to try to perfect it, uh, because you've got to know what the job is, causation, the importance of the harms and losses, and the excuses. And you want to have a really snappy, sane that some that your mother or your coach or your teacher said. Got it. So you can, oh, let me just clarify to everybody. You keep saying you listen to Trial Lawyers University. What you're listening to is TLU On Demand. And so, so just so everybody knows that TLU On Demand is a app for your phone and a website where we everything we've ever done is recorded. Every webinar is on there. Every live event, every, there's eight tracks in Vegas. Every track is recorded. You know, for the last couple of years, there's four tracks in Huntington Beach lecture tracks plus four different masterclass tracks. So we just, there was about 160 hours of new content created last weekend. And so everything we do, we record, we, we, we index, and we put it on TLU On Demand. And we also collect the pleadings, transcripts, and PowerPoints for all these various presentations and cases. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like a library for trial, or I've heard it called like Netflix for trial lawyers. So it's a, it's a, I think it's a great resource to people that use it because the more we listen to how other people put their trials together, their techniques, their strategies, obviously gives us ideas for the cases that we're all working on. And so just to be clear, well, let, me add, you, let, let me add to that. Um, I, the, the app is on your phone and you click on it and then it has a little search bar and you're saying, okay, I'm going to try a premises case. And so you type in premises, and all of a sudden, it's populated with a dozen presentations on a premise case. Or you say malpractice, or you say Dirk Vandiver, or Brian Panish, or Rex Paris, or whoever, and all of a sudden, everything comes out. Harry Plotkin. Almost every time that I, that I 
uh, talk about Vordire, and I talk extensively, as you know, about that, I'll flip up and I'll just say, what's Harry have to say about this? What's Harry Plotkin have to say about this? So it's, it's a remarkable uh, tool that's growing by leaps and bounds every single month. Right, because you know all the, because we and we and you and I are doing a um, webinar. I think on August thirteenth on a wrongful death case, and that's one of the ones we're going to talk about today. Yeah. So, in the last year, you've tried two wrongful death cases. Give us the snapshot right. of each one, and so that we have context for our, the discussion we're about to have. Yes. Um, one of the things, in addition to Lance coming up to me and saying, "I don't get wrongful death," and this is somebody who was just knocking out of the park every time he tried a case, is that it did resonate with me. We all resonate based on our experiences. We're all products of our experiences. And I'm a product of somebody who I thought uh, was had a father at age 50 uh, who was taken from me. So it's a very personal thing for me, wrongful death. And there is no greater harm that could befall not just the person who died, but the family left behind. I look at this as a ripple effect. Yes, it's care and comfort and society and guidance and counsel, and all of those things. But it's the ripple effect. What happens? Because this individual was taken at this time in this violent, preventable inexcusable manner at this time before his time. What does that mean? So again, it's it's very personal to me. Every single time that I have a wrongful death case, I really um, I really pay great attention to it. So the two uh, death cases that I tried last year both happened to be lady uh, ladies who were, were up in age. One was Kathy, uh, Kathleen Miller, who was in her mid-60s. She leaves a husband, who's probably approaching 70, and seven daughters. The second case that I tried, I think that was the sequence, was a lady who was 75 years of age, and she left a husband nearing 80, and she had three children, two daughters and a, a, a son. Both of them truly were indefensible uh, liability cases. Both of them car wrecks. Both of them, ha uh, ha it happened, but when both of them, when the other side went over the center line and hit us head on. Now you'd say, well, of course it's, it's gonna be admitted. But both of them tended to try to just nibble around the edges a little bit, which I don't think really was all that uh, great of a strategy. But they also had to be worried about punitive damages. And so they, were, they felt they were put, great lawyers on the other side, they felt that they were put in uh, to a box whereby it would be difficult. One of them admitted liability, the other did not. Uh, but they were both clear liability. Let, while I'm thinking about it, let me just say this little a bit that I always use when they talk about uh, admitting liability. Yes, the defense here, the table over there, that team over there, they've admitted that going on a highway and crossing over the center line and going into the wrong lane and hitting another person head on, but why? They did do that for whatever that's worth. But you should also consider the benefit that they, as a trial tactic, get from that. The trial tactic that they're using is let's take the attention off of what we did to cause the death of somebody and shift it somewhere else. Something I thought I'd just pop in. All right. So when you're getting ready for trial, the 90 days leading up to it, tell us some of your processes and things that you're doing to get ready to try those, that case. Sometimes people say, do not do this at home, like jackass or whatever. So I got to tell you, do not necessarily do this at home. First of all, I am quite busy with a lot of things, and I know that that's to my detriment. But 
90 days is probably no different than 30 days. But at a, at a time, whether it's 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, or nine days before, what I will do, and one of the reasons I am so insistent on trying to get the message out about this little quote book, the, the manifesto is, you've got to force yourself to put, in my, in my case, because of the, my advanced decrepit age, put pen to paper. And so whether it's 90 days, Dan, or 60 or 30 days, at some point, I put pen to paper and I write just little blurbs uh, of a, that will ultimately turn into a slide in an opening state, a PowerPoint slide. Uh, and so I will do that for the entire, and it'll be scribbled and, and it will, you won't see that really is the final product but I just draw a line. So I, I talk about why are we here? We're here because this person drove over the center line, went into the wrong lane and hit somebody. So I'll put a little synopsis there and then down, down, down. And I will have written out, not written out, but make a, a few words that encapsulates what will ultimately turn into slides. And that's very helpful for me to actually put pen to paper. And then as we get closer and closer, we modify with, with additional uh, materials. All right, so let's talk about jury selection in, in these cases. Well, it, it, as I'm sure some of the people know, this is, this to me, I mean, wrongful death is the type of lawsuit that, that connects with me perhaps most, but the part of the trial that connects for me the most, because it really reminds me of what the founding fathers did in a, a village meeting. We're actually talking with the human beings here. Good morning. Welcome. My name is Dirk Vandiver, and our trial starts right now. We expect that this is going to take five days. And this part, the jury selection, it's the most important part. It happens only in America. And even within America's system, what we're doing right now, the jury selection, this is unique. This is the only time that we get to have a two-way conversation, actually find out about you. Now, that, that oath Remember that the, I, I saw some people kind of look at each other. The reason for that oath that the judge just gave you and made you stand up and put your hand up and take an oath, that makes each one of you an officer of the court. And that's really important here. Because what that means is we're going to work together. We're going to really talk to one another. See, the rest of the trial, people will get up here and they'll say things and you'll very closely look and you'll analyze but this is a two-way conversation. Uh, and what we're trying to do here is we're trying to say, we're not going to be satisfied of the 90 that we have here, not in America. We're not going to be satisfied saying, well, we'll just take the first 12 and they're probably just fine because you're all fair. You'll all listen to the evidence. You'll all listen to the law. But, the, but America knows and this system knows and the beauty of this system is that we know that all humans are different. We know that one person cannot be all things to all people. It just doesn't work. So what we're trying to do here, out of the 90 that have been assembled, and believe me, the law is not wasteful. Out of the 90 that we have as, uh, uh, assembled here, what we're going to do is we're going to work and find the 12 that have the best fit for these specific issues in this specific case. As opposed to say, if you don't serve now, and it's just a patriotic to say, this is not the right case for me. But if you don't serve now, and sometime in the, in the distant future, you do come back, there are gonna be hundreds of other types of cases that you'd say, that's a better fit for me. That's kind of a, that, that's kind of a thing that I say with everybody. It kind of depends. There are other things I can say about what, where I've been try, uh, I've, I've gone to jury selection twice. Can't believe it, but they didn't select me. The defense just kind of were shaking their heads saying, no, we probably don't need this guy. That's quite a surprise, Dirk. <laughs> 
So, so after you do your intro, what are the topics that you think are important to discuss with the jury in, a, in this type of wrongful death case? All right. So number one, I want to talk about the type of case. Now, in a personal injury case, I just right out of the box, it's a personal injury case. Let me step back. Uh, I have a program on TLU that actually several people at Huntington Beach came up and said, hey, I saw your, your program on two bites at the apple. Let me tell you philosophically what, that, what that's talking about. You have, on the one hand, causes king, Keith Mitnick. Get rid of the bad people. It's causes king. You have, on the other hand, Jerry Spence. Build a tribe. And then you have a lot of people on both sides saying, you can't mix messages. You can't say, I want to get everybody off over here, and then I want to build a tribe over there. And I say, not so fast. I say it's possible to do that. You can take a look at the, at the program of TLU, uh, Two Bites at the Apple, if you want to look further about that. But I want to get off the bad people first. But then I want to go around and say, now, not everybody raised their hands here about that question that I specifically asked. Let me ask you and have them tell me and give me, which they do, themes and points to put into the opening statement. I say you can do both. And I say it does not take twice as long. I say it takes just a little bit longer. So your question was, what are the topics? Number one, the type of case. This is a wrongful death case in which you are going to be asked to place a value on a human life. I think that question might prompt some responses from people. It just, it pours over. That's not right. I mean, you, you can't put, you're telling me you put a dollar number on this person's life? I want to hear that. I want to hear all of that. So first, foremost, and always, I want to talk. I want to lead off with the type of case. And if it's a personal injury case, I'm going to talk about those uh, billboards. Everybody here see that billboard from downtown to uh, Arrowhead Stadium, where they flash up sixty million dollar verdict, uh, and you think, but I don't have any idea. Was that too much? Was it too little? Was it just right? I don't know. People have strong feelings about personal injury cases. People have strong feelings about wrongful death cases, and I want to hear about it. So that's number one. Number two, I always, I, I do, all, I, and of course you introduce the people, make sure that they know or don't know. I want to talk about burden of proof, and I personally like Keith's idea. You see, David Ball's idea is to talk about this little bitty, just barely more likely true than not. Yeah, uh, and, and I used to have 10,000 sheets of paper here and 10,000 pieces of paper here and take one off. This is all we have to do to just barely tip, put a feather on the, on the, uh, on the scales, and that wins the day. And it doesn't win the day. You're the one asking for the money, you see. If you do 10000 to 9999 you're likely going to lose your case. It, that may not be the law, but that's the reality, isn't it? And so I kind of like what, what Keith does, which is very briefly. What he talks about is the criminal justice system. Here, this taps into this, particularly conservatives, but for everybody. The, the burden of proof in a criminal case is beyond a reasonable doubt. And so if you're sitting on a murder case and you say, that guy did it. <laughs> I mean, he did it. That's what I believe and that's what all the evidence shows. But that defense lawyer was awfully good. And he created some doubt. And so in a criminal case, if you have any type of doubt, if it's reasonable, even a tiny bit, you following your oath, have to watch that person that you know killed that person walk out of the courtroom without any responsibility or accountability. That taps into something that is universal for what we do. 
You need to be accountable. You need to be responsible for what you have done and what has resulted for it. And then most people feel that more reasonable, more likely true than not, that's that's how I make a decision to make make a major acquisition in life or buy a house or frankly, go to school or do all of these things. Most people think that, except, and then I, 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 we probably don't want to bog down too much of board hour because I could just take a whole day on it. But it then gets into the money because you've always got, you, before that, by the way, you've got to get into sympathy. That's huge. Let me, let me interrupt you for a second though, Dirk, because you just kind of did Keith Mitnick's burden of proof. And just so everybody knows, that is a script. And that script is in the book, Don't Eat the Bruises. Because a lot of people read that book kind of like it's like a fiction or it's entertainment instead of a study guide. But it's very important that you see these scripts and that you that you memorize them and you practice them. Because that one, and then and then adjust it. Because the, that script itself is, folks, now I want to talk to you all about the burden of proof in this civil case as opposed to a very different burden in a criminal case where a person is accused of a crime by the government and may go to jail. Now, have we all heard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt? And raise it, everybody's heard it. And now, this is a very high standard. It almost requires black and white certainty. So for, for folks that are required to use this very high level of measuring justice, it can be frustrating for them because they can almost be certain that a person did it, yet be required to vote not guilty, and allow that person to walk out of the court without any accountability if the defense is able to create any doubt by, you know, hiring experts, mudding up the waters, or just throwing things against the wall to see if they'll stick. You see, in a, in a, in a criminal case, creating a doubt creates an out. Where in a civil case like this, where nobody's going to jail, you know, you can have all the doubts you want. Just as long as you consider all of them, you know, you basically believe that we're more likely right than wrong. You know, and so the question is, is it just a more likely than not? And is, is everybody comfortable using this, I guess, this more reasonable method of measuring justice of more likely than not? Da, 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 da. So whatever, you know, that's just a, a paraphrase of it. But you have to understand why, you know, somebody gives you a script, what each part of it does. And like that script, I think is wonderful because it really cre- it really kind of causes the jury to to compare the defendant's actions to being a criminal. And you know, because when they kill somebody, it's kind of you know, I know it's called negligence, but depending on how negligent they are, you know, it's like, hey, they're lucky we're not going to jail. They just have to pay money because we're civilized. So anyways, I just want to point that out, that these are scripts. These are scripts that need to be just like what you started out with, you know, about the jury empowerment and the raising the right hand and that your officers of the court. That's a script. You didn't just like sit here for the first time and, and it spontaneously came to you because you're so brilliant. No, you wrote it out. You practiced it. You used it in court. You refined it. You evolved it. And it's, I can see it's very effective. I mean, it's the first time I've ever heard of anything, you know, like that as an intro, but I'm like, that's great. That can really help people because that's always the toughest part is getting that rapport going, get that connection with the jury. So that that's really important what you just said. I have also heard, Dan, you and some other terrific trial lawyers have a quasi debate about that topic, which is, oh, you don't really need to memorize anything. You don't really need to have a script. I, I, just, I, I, I tell you that I, now I've done this so many times that of course it comes out as hopefully spontaneous. But the reality is you have to put the hard work in. That's why I say, and one of the reasons I am going to come back at this uh, manifesto, you want to write things out. You want to make sure that you have them pen to paper. So I can't agree with you more on that. That's a really important tip. All right. Well, and, and so sympathy. How do you talk about sympathy in the wrongful death? Okay. So back up a little bit. I have the burden of proof. I have to show you that there was negligence. That's not just an accident. I use the word accident because they're going to use it. This is negligence. We have to prove, more likely than not, that there was negligence. 
we have to prove more likely than not that this caused a wreck that caused a death. And then we have to prove more likely true than not what the damages are, what the harms are. And if we fail in any one of those areas, we're out of court. Miss Jones, if we come in here and I'm just talking and talking to you, but I don't produce any evidence, what's the right verdict? The verdict is get out of court. You don't get a dime. Now, there's a whole bunch of reasons philosophically why people would do that to basically say, why am I taking on an additional burden? One of the things I want to talk to you about, though, is sympathy. Because sympathy, and I'm not sure I've ever heard anybody say it exactly this way, but this is how I view it. Sympathy means you're making decisions without evidence. You're making decisions just based on some type of gut reaction that the evidence doesn't lead you to. And that's not permitted. We're not allowed under this system, and that's a good thing. We're not allowed in this particular system to say, you can just use sympathy and just find whatever you want, regardless of what the evidence says. So, for example, does anybody here say, yeah, simply because somebody died, I'm going to give you whatever you want. I, I, I say that every single thing that you uh, say is correct because somebody died. Some 75-year-old lady died. Yeah, I, I'm going to agree with everything just because of that. Anybody? I've never heard of a single person that's ever raised their hand, but maybe this is a first time for everything. Nobody. Okay. Now I need to flip it to the other side. And by the way, in these two cases, Dan, these were both against individuals. So individual, I mean, sympathy for individuals, you've got to talk about. And frankly, when you have a corporation, you got to talk about it as though they have sympathy because they've had this terrific reputation about providing service and all this. But let's go with the true individuals because that's what I, that's what both of those cases last year were. This is an individual we're bringing the suit against. As you can see over there on, at, the, at the defense table among all of the boxes and the files and whatever is, is Mr. Jones. And he's not Coca-Cola. And he's not Amazon. He's an individual. Now, there's a couple of different ways. Let me give you John Turner's way to do it first, which is I want you to imagine something. I want you to imagine that John, that we're trying this case with John Jones. Mr. Jones, certain out of there, seems like a nice individual. John Jones. And where every single piece of evidence is exactly the same. And then right next door, right across the aisle there, we have the exact same thing. The same death, the same circumstances, the same facts, the same people who lost their mother and their wife. Everything is exactly the same, except it's not John Jones. You see, it's Jeff Bezos, or it's perhaps uh, the president of BP Oil. Uh, they're still individuals. But who here will tell me who here will say, I need you to dig deep on this? Who here will tell me, you know, <laughs> depending on what you're asking, and believe me, we're going to ask for a very substantial amount here, but depending on what you're asking, yeah, I, that would factor into this because I would want to know what the effect is going to be of this verdict that we have on this individual. Whereas if it's Jeff Bezos or the president of BP, that's really not going to happen. Who here will say, yeah, I mean, I'm human. Uh, I, I, would, I would say that would affect me some way. So that's one way to do it. Um, and I mean, there are many other, uh, obviously, as well. But I, I kind of like that one. And then, All right. then the last one, Dan, because I'm sure you're going to say, and is there a, another really important one? And obviously, everybody knows what it is. It's the damages. It's the ass. And you can, you can parlay that burden of proof exactly the way Dan just said it and, and kind of the way that I just said it. So everybody's comfortable with more likely true than not. And I got to tell you right now, almost everybody goes right down the line saying, yeah, I mean, I make important decisions that way. That makes sense. It's what the law is. I'm going to follow the law. Um, but I got to tell you, <laughs> I have a brother who's a CPA 
uh, is a, a CFO, a chief financial officer. He makes decisions all the every day, 25, 50 million, 70 million dollars, just does it all the time. And he does that on the basis of what's more likely true than not. Except when it comes to placing a dollar value on a human life or a dollar value on somebody who's no longer able to walk, somebody who's in a wheelchair. When it comes to that, and if it comes to several, many, many millions of dollars, then there's a problem. Who here would say that, I got to tell you, many millions of dollars, if you're asking for many millions of dollars, several millions of dollars, if you're asking for that, for the loss of a life, I'm going to need more than just more likely true than not. Uh, how many people here would say, you know, and you can have both sides. You'd have some people say, well, this is a law. That's, I'm fine. But other people said, you're now not only asking me to put a dollar amount on a human being. You're now asking me to put a very high dollar amount on the loss of a human being. And you're saying that I've got to do it on the basis of more likely than not. I got a problem with that. I'm going to struggle with that a little bit. So I, you, you've got, in every case, you've got to do that, but particularly in a wrongful death. And so when you talk about the value and the money, but how do you, how do you really talk about it? I mean, you know, I, I'm not clear. I mean, is it well, going to be like, we're going to ask you for millions right. and millions of dollars. We're going to ask you for 10, no less than $10 million for the loss of this life. I mean, do Missouri law allows, requires that if somebody's life was taken wrongfully, that the jury can sit as appraisers and place a dollar number, not just out of the air, not something that somebody just picked out of absolutely nothing, but based on the evidence that you hear. And let's take each one of these four, because there are four different people here. Three of them were children. One of them was the husband. Let's take, for example, a husband. The, the law says for each one of these people separately, we're now looking at the husband. What do you say the evidence has shown you in terms of the dollar value of comfort between those two? What about, what about over here, Tanya? The fact that when she was just about ready to quit school, uh, and now I'm going a little bit perhaps into the opening statement, but you're going to hear evidence on instruction that was given at a time in the past. And we are going to say that she continues to give instruction and guidance, and you're going to get evidence on that, and you're going to be asked to place a dollar number, because that's our system, a dollar number on the comfort that has been lost between man and wife. You're going to be asked to give a dollar number for the instruction and the guidance between her adult child, no question about that. And by the way, let me back up. You said, what do we ask in more dire and in, 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 uh, in a wrongful death case? Oh my gosh. This might be the most important thing beyond placing a dollar number on, the, on life, and that's adult children. If, if you, please remember that. You're representing a spouse and adult children, you've got to say, and I'm going to tell you, it's not just dollar number for the, uh, the value of life, but it's a dollar number for the value of life of a child who's grown up, gone out on their own, has her own job, has her own children. And we're going to say, say that we're going to have evidence that will show you that even now, and for the next 20 years, there is a significant value on, on the instruction. Well, all right. And I would uh, just, you know, I think part of the preparation for voir dire is that the practice, you know, especially if maybe you haven't done 50 trials to, d to do, you know, practice whatever segments you're going to do in voir dire with a focus group and, and get the reps in, but also be ready for anything the jury is going to throw at you. Because on a wrongful death case like this, you're, you're in at least a lot of cases, you're bound to get the question, you know, I don't understand how 
you know, what could the money's going to do or how the money's going to be helpful, you know, these kinds of questions. And, you know, you have to be ready for those types of questions because I think when you get resistance like that, you know, first you have to meet it with, you know, that's a, that's a great question. You know, what good will the money do? Or, you know, how's the money going to help? I mean, I, I bet you're probably not alone. I bet probably other people are probably thinking or feeling some of the same things. Who else is with Dirk? Okay, everybody's thinking this, right? And so I think having something, you know, kind of set, like, you know, folks, let me ask you, let me ask you all, what would perfect justice look like in a case like this one right here? And you pause for a moment, let him think. But I mean, wouldn't it be somehow if we, if we had this time machine that we could all just step into and just spin the earth back at its axis and that, and this, that this never had to happen? I mean, wouldn't that be perfect justice? And you let it pause for it, let him think about it. Like, obviously that would, right? But, but, but we don't have the power to do that. All that we can do for justice is award money or, or place a, a value on these lives. And, you know, I know that this is not enough. I know it's far from perfect, but it's all we got. So does this help everybody you know, kind of better understand why we have this type of system? And then you pause for a little bit. And then if you want to, you can be, because, you know, because you can see their faces, but they can't see each other, right? Because they're all looking at you and say, folks, here's another way to think about it. You know, there, there are some countries in this world, they have a different form of justice. And, and we call this an eye for an eye. Has everybody heard of this term before? Of course, you get all the nods and say, Dirk, how would you define an eye for an eye? And you'll say something that along the lines like, well, have you heard that if, Yeah, that literally means that if somebody killed my wife, I'm going to kill their wife. Right. And so once we prove our case against the defendant, if we lived in that kind of system, what would, jury, what would the law require us to do to the defendant so that, that he or she could truly understand the kind of pain and suffering that their choices had inflicted upon my client's family. And you pause, everybody gets the vision of that. It's like, but that would be barbaric, wouldn't it? And fortunately for everybody, including the defendant, that we're civilized. So, so, so we don't do it like that. We just use money. And like I said, I know it's not enough. I know it's far from perfect, but that's, yeah. that's how we do it in, in the great it's state of Missouri, not. in the United States of America. So hopefully that helps everybody kind of understand this better. So anyways, but whether, you know, but the idea is to have these pieces. So when people come at you with what you could expect them to come at you with, you're ready to go. You're not nervous because, because you're prepared. So that's what people think about. Okay. Let's move on. Go ahead. No, it's one thing and then the we will move on. He mentioned this, but I want to make sure that everybody understands it. You are loving the bad answers. You, you want those, but thank you so much for having the courage to tell me that. Um, that that's art. All right. Let's move on to opening statement. Tell us how you approach the opening statement in these wrongful death cases. I did it two different ways. And in fact... If I'm not mistaken, one, first of all, I do David Ball just immediately going into uh, uh, the rules. Just, you know, a driver must maintain control over his vehicle at all times. Driver must ne never unnecessarily cross the center line into the opposite, uh, into the opposite uh, lane of travel. A driver must never be reckless when they are driving on the vehicle or driving the vehicle. Uh, and if they violate that and somebody dies, that driver has to be fully responsible and fully accountable for any of the harms and losses. That's one, that's one way. I did one one way and one the other, and I think it was truly because of something that I heard at Huntington Beach last year. And the other way I started it was, let's get immediately into why we're here. Because everybody wants to know why we're here. We're here because another driver on a highway crossed the center line and hit somebody I represent and killed them and left, and, and left without a mother and without a wife, four people whose stories you're going to be hearing today. That's why we're here. And, you know, the case is, on the one hand, extremely simple to understand. Keep control of your vehicle. On the other hand, it's extremely important 
because you're, it's important for everybody that it that requires and ensures and expects a safe highway. And it says that you, as members of the jury, are going to put a value on that which we most value. So I did it both ways. And, and I've done the David Ball just boom, boom, boom. And then I did it this way. And frankly, I kind of like the that one way, which is I want to tell you right now what we're doing here. And just right into it. And, and that may work a little bit better with cases that, if not outright, uh, admitted liability very close to it because you're now not you don't ever want to argue you don't ever want to say we're here or I don't think we're here because somebody ran a red light when there's a witness that said you ran the red light because everything is credibility and you just lost all credibility when you said we're here because this person ran the red light and there's another witness that said you did that but if it's if it's very if it's very confident that you're going to be able to show that, I almost like the other better. Here's okay. why we're here. All right. So that's how we start off. But, you know, in these, in these opening statements, you know, what, what's your, do you, what's your visual strategy? I mean, do you do this, everything? Do you have lots of PowerPoints and foam core boards is pretty much you just telling the jury what happened. Well, and, and we've had this discussion too. And, if anything, perhaps, we're not using any uh, PowerPoints here. If anything, I may feel that I believe everybody is a visual learner. You and I have had this conversation, and you make the equally valid point that people want to be talk uh, talked with. You want to have an actual conversation. You want to discuss what the story is. And so hopefully, I do a little bit of both, but I do use a lot of visuals. Gosh, I remember one of the very first uh, webinars that we did, and I showed you all the visuals, and you go, whoa, this is an overwhelming number of visuals. Um, and I've talked to the people. I've talked to people after, after the verdicts. And by and large, I think what they say is, I am having, you did have a conversation with me, but you also had a visual. One of the things that I try not to do is I try not to necessarily talk over text, which means that I'm the one they're listening to, but they're looking over here and say, well, what am I supposed to be doing now? If you want them to read something, I'd say, so for example, one of the pieces of evidence that you're going to hear in this case and see in this case and read for yourself is going to be something right out of the emergency medical service technologies report the EMTs right there on the scene. And then you're pointing to it and they're reading it and you're not talking while you're pointing to it. They're reading. So that's kind of a philosophical answer, I guess, to the question about what you do. I hopefully do a little bit of both. All right. And do you mention, how do you mention, or how do you talk about the money that you're eventually going to be asking for? Because a lot of folks say, hey, right. you get that number out there that you want early, get the jury used to it so they're not like shocked at the end. And a lot of people, other people are like, hey, I just say a lot of money or millions and millions of dollars because, you know, I want to keep the mystery going as to, to what number I'm eventually going to come. I want to see what the evidence looks like, how it all flows in before as I get, you know, build my, I guess, my own feeling through the trial. Like, what should the number be? I have an idea, but I just haven't concretized it within me yet. Right, and and that even really goes back further to Vordire, uh, because a lot of I've heard a lot of people have arguments about that. Do you give a specific dollar amount in the Vordire? And I think I tend not to do that, but I tend to make sure that I've talked about a lot of big numbers: sixty million, sixty million dollar uh, verdict on a billboard, uh, or the fact that we have a hundred million miles of so and so. So they've heard a lot of big numbers. And then when I come to the very bottom, I say, and I'm not going to ask you right now for an exact dollar number. First of all, I, I don't think it's fair to you. You haven't heard a bit of evidence. But I am going to tell you, because one thing I don't want to do, and I've been again where you are, is to be around, hanging around for hours and days and weeks and never even understand what we're, what we're talking about. 
And so I will tell you up front, it's going to be many, many millions of dollars. Or what I'm going to do in this case in September, not the one I'm trying in a couple of weeks or the one after that, but the one I'm trying in September, I'm going to ask for an amount of money that none of you have ever even dreamed of, ever thought of, ever written down before. And you can't tell me whether or not that's okay, first of all, because I haven't told you what that number is. But also, you haven't had a bit of evidence to know whether it's justified. So I'm not going to ask you what I would consider to be an unfair question. Would you award $52,500,000? I'm not, not going to do that. But what I am going to do is I'm going to say, will everybody commit to looking very close at the evidence, following the evidence under the law and saying, I will give you a fair shot. If you have proven more likely true than not that this is many, many millions of dollars, I'm not going to stand up and say, nope, that crosses a threshold. There's a certain threshold above which I'm never going to be able to go. Then when I go into opening statement, I think personally that most people nowadays, and you know more than me, most people do give a specific dollar number in opening statement. And I don't always do that. And as part of what you just were talking about before, which is how comfortable are you in that number? Because in both of those cases, neither of those cases, did I give a number in opening statement or in, in uh, or not. I said many, many billions. And I said it again in opening, just like I did in the word higher. But I didn't know exactly how things were going to go. And there were some real, there was some real trepidation by me. There were a few witnesses that I just didn't know how they were going to go. And they went great. And then I thought, boom, and we'll take care of this in closing. I've already said many, many millions of dollars. All right. Now let's look at, you know, order of proof direct examination. How do you go about thinking what, who to lead off with in these wrongful death cases? What witness to put on first? Let's, let's take the admitted liability case versus the contested, if, if it's a difference for you. Yeah, it, yeah, it is. Although in the state of Missouri, for example, you are not barred from producing some evidence that they're not going to let you go on and on. But you're barred from you're not barred from producing some evidence that in fact will show what the circumstances, because at least the reasoning of the Missouri courts is it would be depriving them and having a naked admission of liability strip you of the ability to even understand what it is you're really in. You don't even know what the ecosystem is, as Randy Sorrell says. You don't even know really exactly what it is you're talking about. So in, in those cases, what I start out with in terms of the order of proof is I will get a police officer because this person has no skin in the game. And there are going to be several things which that police officer are going to be able to show that lay the foundation. If it's not that, if it's not an admitted liability case, I'm going to probably put up what I think is going to be the strongest liability witness. And sometimes that's going to be the defendant. And if I feel confident, that's what I do. I get them up there and I cross-examine and I try. I mean, this is something we all say we do, and but we're all human beings. And I try to be kind. I try to say, you know, you, you knew you had that. You had to, to defer the right away. You knew that you had to allow other people to go out. And you were right at the stop sign, right? And you knew that one of the things that you had to do is you had to wait until you were sure the traffic had cleared before you pulled out. But you didn't do that. Or, or if you can do kindness that way, certainly that is the way. I've done that in malpractice cases. And believe me, when you have somebody that you know from deposition is arrogant, it's tough. To, to not suddenly react as though the juror just saw six hours of deposition where this guy was arrogant. No, you got to start out kind. you got to start out that way. But that's what I do on order of proof. 
start out strong, the very strongest you can be, at least I think go with, I've heard other people say something different. Start out with liability, the strongest liability case that you've got. So, but the damages aspect of these wrongful death cases, how, let's call it for a ch an adult child. What is the sequence or preparation and topics that you cover to help the jury understand the loss? What I try to do with those adult children, and did in both of these, those cases last year, is I would say, we're going to get together, we're going to talk about things, but here's what I don't want you to say. I miss mom. I am grieving over mom. First of all, Missouri law, that's not a permitted element of damage. In fact, it specifically states you are not supposed to give anything for grief or bereavement. So I'll make sure that, by the way, the jury knows that when I'm at it, in both Vordire and the opening state, we're not asking for a penny for grief and bereavement. That's negative. That's something that doesn't have any place here. What we're doing is we're talking about evidence that you're going to hear about the positive values of this human, of the comfort and the guidance and the instruction. So what I do with the individuals who are the adult children is I say, I want four stories. I had seven, so and maybe five stories. I'm trying to get it into digestible bite sizes. I want a story about, and by that time, I already know that there's a story about the cake. Okay, who here wants to tell me about the story of, uh, of that when Kathleen baked the cake because uh, the, your original cake was gone and she came through? Oh, I'll, I'll talk about that. All right, tell me about that. I want stories. I don't want you to say, boo-hoo, I miss mom. I mean, th the tears came, but it was organic. I want very concrete stories. And of course, bear in mind this, Dan. All of those stories, which is the way that human beings learn information about something that they don't know, which is the relationship there. All of those stories are in the past. And what you need to do is you need to say, yeah, that's in the past, but what about the next 20 years? I mean, what, what then? I mean, you, you were given great advice when you were a kid. Yeah, when you were a child and, and you were a teenager and you broke your ankle and you couldn't do this, mom was there for you. That's great. But what's that really have to do with this, which is to say, her life expectancy was another 20 years. 20 years. This is she is without the instruction and guidance and counsel. And some may argue all of the guidance and counsel, all of the instruction, that's in the past. There isn't anything now. They have their own jobs. They have their own lives. They have their own children. They have all of that. And so I want a story that will take them, transport them into the future, that will say, what about after you were out of, uh, uh, of school? What about when you were an adult? What about when you did have your own children? I want stories like that, not just the ones of ancient history, because that's going to take them into the future and give you what you need. And I, I think it goes, how, how do you go about choosing which stories do you want to tell? Right, and and there there's some I love. I gotta tell you, um, John uh, practiced speed trial before Joe Freed talked about speed trial, and I remember being in several trials with John. This is decades ago, but a long time ago, and he would come to the end of a, an examination, and that was it. That's all I had. What? And I thought that was really powerful. Because he actually got to the point and then he got out again. So what are the stories that I select? The ones that affect me the most. When I, when I hear about the fact that I was a single mother in Denver, I didn't know anybody, and who's the first person I call? It's mom. Yeah, but you were an adult. You had you, you had your own children. You were looking for a work. Yeah, but that was the person that I went to. Tell me about that. And don't make the stories terribly long. I mean, make sure that it's punchy to the point. It has a point. So what do I decide? I decide 
those stories which are most compelling that have a point that will allow me to say in closing argument, this translates to the future. This translates to the job you have. This isn't just when she was five years old and she had a boo-boo on her knee and they, and they cleaned it up. This is something that's happening now and it will likely still happen or would have still happened had she still been alive. All right. Let's, let's, let's now, we're done putting our case on. The defense has a chance now. And I really want to talk about your approach to the preparation for and the execution of the cross-examination of defense experts. Right. The, the cross-examination of dense defense experts is very, very different than the cross-examination of the defendant, in my view. In my view, first of all, you have to be kind with everybody. I don't know if you ever heard the story about Jerry Spence saying that he had absolutely crucified a defense expert and he had cut the head off and put it on a stake and was parading it around and he lost the case. It was the only case he ever lost. By the way, the other thing that he said that was so incredibly insightful is I didn't identify the common enemy. Okay, the common enemy the predecessor to the reptile, let's say. But the common enemy is something that in a kind fashion you want to make sure uh, of with regard to your cross-examination with the defense experts. You want to make sure that you, and I mean, like Pat Malone, I think has been on, on uh, TLU. I'm sure he has. Um, and what he says is a little bit different than what some other people say, which is if there's, there's a difference, the defendant didn't have a choice to be here. The defendant had a lawsuit brought against them. That's one of the fears that we all have, isn't it? So you really need to be kind of them. With regard to the, uh, with regard to the defense uh, experts, I say start out as kind as you can with the absolute, when you talk about preparation, you're talking about AI, you're talking about Google, you're talking about talking to your experts, you're talking about reading, 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 getting into the literature, getting into the weeds, and coming up with a series of rules that are common sense that everybody that's reasonable has to do. I mean, as an example, Dan, if we were in a wrongful death case where a patient is in the post-op room, first of all, that's the ecosystem that Randy talks about. The ecosystem is there's a risk when you're in the post-op room that uh, you got uh, uh, you got the risk that you perhaps had a little hole pu punched into your bowel and it's now leaking out slowly. So the risk of being in the post-op room is that you're going to dismiss any complaints as minor and turn around away from the patient and go home. So one of the things that I like to do is to start out with a general rule that I think they would have to agree with and then kind of go down on the basis of literature, on the basis of the specific facts and talk about the fact that when you have, when you have just operated on a person that has a massive amount of, of scar tissue that required a great deal of handling of the scar tissue, you realize that one of the potential risks is that a hole will be punched. It either is at the time or it's delayed. And you realize that if that risk actually happens, that could threaten the person's life. Would you agree with me that one of the things that you need to do is to consider all of the information that is available to you to be certain that you don't think there's anything else that needs to be done to rule out a potential deadly condition before you go home? Now, are they going to... They probably will squabble with me, but if they do squabble, first of all, they may not. They may say, yeah, no, that sounds fair. And that's the theme of your case. So I want to get as much as I can in terms of the theme of my liability case through them, through well-crafted, well-researched rules of the road. That's what I want to do with the defense expert. And you might also be able to uh, uh, hook a ride. You would agree that regardless what you say should or shouldn't have before, 
The reason this man's dead is that uh, is that bile and fluid and and feces were leaking out into his abdomen, and it killed him. It caused his death. I mean, they may just give that to you. But remember, we always have four things we're talking about: the job, causation, damages, and their excuses. I want to I want to talk about all four of those, and I want to really research them. All right. And then finally, when they rest, we get to the closing argument. And so how do you approach the closing in these wrongful death cases? You know, um, we, beforehand, right before this, we were talking about some of the terrific trial lawyers that start in. One of them, of course, is Rex Paris. I love his opening. Now, I start every single case since I heard him say it several years ago. Folks, thank you for being here. Thank you for the investment that you've made in this case. The investment that you have made in our system. And I say it that way because I know this has come at a personal cost to you. This comes at a time you've got everything that's going on with, with your life and yet you're here. And you're here in this courtroom doing your job and that job is to pay very careful attention and we appreciate the attention the attention you give to frankly one of the largest cases i've ever had had the opportunity to try and it deals with the most important thing in life and that is life itself dan one of the things that i do on all damages whether it's a personal injury wrongful death is i go directly to the constitution it helps the fact that I actually believe it, not in the Constitution, Declaration of Independence. It helps that I really believe this. But the people that this resonates with more than anybody uh, beyond the tree huggers like me is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness on our terms. We get to do that. We get to say, this is exactly what has brought meaning to my life. And one of the things that we've all talked about in the jury selection, we've outlined it in opening, you've heard all of the evidence now is, you're the ones that are going to assess the value of each one of these positive components of life. You are going to be the one that is going to be able to say, Tanya, yes, she's an adult, but Tanya... She continued to rely upon, weigh into, get guidance from that mother of hers. And what she has lost here is very valuable. One of the things, and I'll skip because I, I don't know, I'm probably way beyond, but one of the things that, um, uh, that I like to do is a case, we have a, we have a jurisdiction venue where you do not get to, do, to argue uh, per diem. We don't get to. That's what Keith does. It's what everybody does, it seems like to me. But we do have a case called Graff versus Baptist Temple, which was one, one of Tom Strong's cases, where you say you can't multiply. You can't say it's worth a dollar per hour or it's worth a dollar per day. You can't do mathematics. But you can do the same thing. You say this, we're talking about a time frame of 20 years, 20 years, four different people for 20 years, each have lost the value of the society and the guidance and the services. My heavens, you've heard all from Mark about what she did on a day-to-day -day basis that he doesn't have anybody else do right now. 20 years. I say that it's not unreasonable for four different people with nine different elements for 20 years to say this case has a value of $20 million. Now, some people would say, well, gosh, that sounds an awful lot like, like per diem, but it's not. It's been approved in that case. And I say, first of all, I don't understand why it's improper to do a per diem, but I ascribe to that now. That's what I do. And I try... The, the, David Ball, who is a freaking genius, of course, and has given so much to us, including the more likely true than not with the hands and, and all of those things, the burden of proof, all of that. 
But what he says about damages applies to wrongful death as, as well as it does any personal injury. And that is how bad, how long he puts it number two, and how interfering. I, I, I change that up a little bit, specifically to make the argument that I just made there. How bad is it? Folks, you've heard from the doctor. This is severe. The whole basis of our system is if there's a small damage, there's a small amount of compensation, a small amount of money damages. If it's moderate, a moderate amount. If it's a severe damage, the worst damage, the loss of a human life, it's at a severe level. That's how bad it is. Then you talk about how impactful it is. And each one of you, when we're trying to be efficient here, each one of you have heard the stories of each one of these people as they, in fact, are telling them what they have had taken away from them. That's how it impacts them. It impacts them every single day, every single week, every single year. And then finally, how long? And that's where I say you can just go right into how long. Because I always say, you look at the, the uh, life expectancy, and I say for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, whatever it is, I say it's not unreasonable at all that it's justified by the evidence that each one of you heard it to you. We suggest you're the one that decides. I suggest to you that this, in fact, fully merits this. And frankly, folks, the reason that I've asked for $20 million, I didn't have the guts to ask for what it's really worth. Thank you. Now, do, in, in Missouri, do you get a separate rebuttal or is it one? Okay. And so now the defense does whatever they do to try to keep the number down. So when it comes to rebuttal, do you have like a set frame that you kind of follow and, and then kind of tweak it based upon what the defense did? Absolutely, I do. And and this is kind of along the lines of you talked about, uh, Dan, which is, of course, you want to appear spontaneous. Uh, of course, you want to, you're speaking from the heart. Of course, you don't want to have a bunch of notes that you're reading from, which I never, I don't even have notes up there. But you need to think about it. And you need, for me, I need to have put pen to paper at some point to make sure that I know what it is. Here's what I do. And this will be very short because I know we're running on, uh, up against it. But I listen very carefully. By the way, you ask, what do you do with a cross-examination defense experts? You listen very carefully to what they actually said. You've got a bunch of questions you're going to ask, and then you just keep asking them listening to what the response is, is it's everything. So in rebuttal, it's the same thing. It doesn't matter what they've said. It doesn't matter how they've said it. I'll use an example. Mr. Vandiver just came up here and asked for $12 million. And this was in a, in a county where the biggest verdict had ever been was $75,000. He just asked for $12 million. I mean, I don't know about you, but that was shocking to me. I mean, it, it just, that's me. It's shocking. So she says all this stuff. And then in, in rebuttal, shocking. $12 million for the loss of a leg is shocking. Let me tell you what was shocking. What was shocking is when Betsy looks down and feels a horrible electric pain in her toes and pulls the covers back and doesn't see toes. She doesn't see a foot. She doesn't see a leg. That's what's shocking. And what our system provides for is that we have a system where you are going to be fully compensated, not partially, not because the, da the injury or damage is so big that it requires a judgment that is so big. So shocking, yes. My client is going to be shocked for the rest of her life. And what we expect here and what we believe you're going to do is you're going to do the two things that this jury system does for us. Nan, I always say these things. This is what I always say when people say, what good does it do? Number one, it rebalances things. That's how bad, how interfering, and how long it rebalances 
This is the only thing that we can ask for, and this is the only way that it happens. To rebalance, to make it up for this person who unnecessarily lost a leg. And the second thing that it does, it is the only way in our system that we make sure that people who are negligent, who have caused great harm, are, uh, are held fully accountable for what they have done. Two things always. That's why it does good. It rebalances and it holds the people accountable every time. You can say that. You can say that in more dire in opening and closing. And it happens to have the benefit of being the truth. The benefit of the truth. So we're, we're pretty much all done here. I know. Dirk, but there was two things I need to ask you that we brought up earlier and I wanted to follow up on. One, you said that, you know, when you were younger, you were involved in theater a lot, performing in front of 1,500 people. So, yeah. like, how tell us, like, that theatrical, how long were you involved with the theater for in the years to say? Well, I, I, was, I was involved up until the very point that I said, hey, Dad, good news, I'm going to the Pasadena Playhouse. Hey, Dirk, good news. No, you're not. What what happened is, and this is maybe too long, but I'll make it very, very short. In fact, the, the competing ham, if you will, of my high school went on to become an internationally known uh, rock star, broadcaster, uh, DJ. It's unbelievable. But what would happen is I would be so thirsty for going in front of people and talking to people, that I would make things up. We had a 3,000, I think 3,000 population. And so what would happen is at the entire school would go to an assembly. And what would happen is they would have 1,500 and then would take a quick break and then the next 1,500. And so if it was a football assembly, they said, well, he plays football. Uh, so I understand that. Or if it was like an advertisement for the, uh, the, the, the play, well, he's the lead in the play, so that makes sense. But then I started to do other things, like I would go up during the Red Cross to whoever the teacher was that would be responsible for putting on and say, hey, uh, what I need is I need five minutes. I'm going to do a little uh, play on words here. I'm going to probably bring a couple of people in, and we can do that right after the initial uh, commentary. Oh, okay. Okay. This is the power of acting as if. Act as if. I'm telling you, this is a huge. This is a huge thing that I give to Bart and Brooke, my kids. Act as if you're succeeding. Don't act as if you hate what you're doing. Don't act as if somebody just took your head off. You act as if you belong there because you know what? You do. So that's what I did on theater. So how do you think all that theatrical training and background help you become the trial lawyer you are? Because everybody's got their life experiences and stuff that kind of helps mold who they are. And it just seems like, because I sit and talk to a lot of great trial lawyers, and often we find, I find something in their background, sports, being in the center of attention, Brian Panish, you know, college football, right. Ben Rabinowitz, he was a champion college wrestler. The things that that the people that gravitate towards the, the, the spotlights because they, they draw energy from the group, from the, from the audience. That, that's a really good way to, to say it. I draw energy. As you can see, I am somewhat animated. And in fact, folks, just so you know, Dan uh, said right before, you know, maybe you need to pull it down a little bit so we really have a conversation. No, no, you wouldn't have said that. But I love it. I mean, this is one of the reasons that I'm going to continue to do that. So I, I draw energy and I draw purpose from what happened with my dad. And then the other, the last thing, Dan, is competition. I just, I was the, I was the lightest starter on my high school football team. And we had a championship team and they asked the, the head coach, truly, they said, e you have the center occupied by a 175 pound guy what's going on he said you know dirk may be small 
but he's deceptively slow. <laughs> Not even sure. And I just brought that up because, like, you know, that's training. You know, the theatrical stuff was training. He took, right. you know, acting classes, I'm sure, in high school before. You didn't yeah. just get invited to this Pasadena Conservatory, whatever, because yeah. your name was Dirk. It's because you trained. Right. And, you know, I think so many trial lawyers, these trial lawyers these days do not engage in physical training. And, right. you know, and it's such an important thing. Because there's the strategic part, there's the the questions, there's the evidence, and that's the stuff we're talking about right now. But I think it's important because you know, like once a month, you know, I run, you know, boot camps at my condo, oh. teaching so everybody could be intentional with their eye contact, their facial expressions, their hand movements, their voice, and things like that. And that you know, it's about the intentionality. And with the training, I think, because a lot of people get affected by nerves, especially younger lawyers, but every lawyer gets affected by, by serious affected by nerves. And you know, I think the only way to get through those nerves is to train and then to get up there and, and try and practice and train and just keep that circle going. It's a virtuous circle of improvement. And everything we do here, everything we talk about, everything we keep learning is just like getting that confidence, getting to that relaxed place where it's just like, you know, I mean, after 50 years of doing this, I'm sure that's every time they still feel a little bit of those butterflies but it's more relaxed more confident more excited to be there i mean you know what because you probably try what six cases a year yeah, how many would bunch. you say you average a bunch and yeah and and lastly you mentioned i think earlier that, that you're going to do something with randy sorrels in yeah in vegas uh, is that I'm, right I'm, tell us tell yeah, us a little bit more randy. about that Randy, he's been on before. He at one point he had the largest individual compensatory damage for a, a, a injury to a single individual, three hundred fifty million dollars or something. And so Randy and I, Randy attended the uh, the uh, the uh, manifesto that I had, and I and he said, "God, this is great, Dirk. You really need to get it out." So I want to get it out. But the other thing that I want to do is try to get him in. He, in fact. Dan, one of the things that you said is you've got to prepare a response for what you know you're going to hear from the jury, from witnesses. I mean, for example, what good does it do? I know these two things, they're burned in my brain. It rebalances something that was taken away unjustifiably and it has full accountability. So if you, I mean, what Dan is saying about the training, oh my heavens i mean that's everything you know if, if you get a chance to go out to one of those boot camps by all means do that and then when you have that opportunity to train and do that get to you if i one one thing that i could say is two things i'm going to say and i'll close with this one get the tlu app it, it is i don't even know what it costs but it's way too cheap because it it prepares you for every single case that you have, every single one. And then the last thing, Dan, that I'm going to close with, and I'm gonna also say this uh, next week at the, at the MATA annual convention, are the words that my mother said, two words, secret to happiness, remain curious. If you remain curious, you're gonna go ahead and get that training that Dan's talking about. You're going to go ahead to some of these live events. You're going to go ahead and listen to TLU on demand. Right. And so well, I'll be seeing you in October in Vegas. And I'll see you before that yes. on August 13th on Bye. our webinar. And just to remind everybody, Vegas is at Caesars Palace. And, you know, we're very, it's going to be, it's going to be amazing. There's going to be so many great trial lawyers there. And these workshops we talked about has eight lecture tracks. Those are great. But there's also 20 workshops. And the workshops are small group trainings that last either a half a day or a full day, taught by one you know, very accomplished trial lawyer to help people get up and learn a skill. And you know, usually there's five to 10 people in a group and people up there practicing cross, voir dire, opening, Whatever it is, the skill, direct examination of an expert. These are all skills that we need to practice. And it helps when we practice that we have a, a coach kind of giving us feedback and kind of demonstrating how to do it at a higher level. Because we all only know what we know. And until somebody shows us how to do it maybe a little bit different, we practice and develop a new neural pathway of how we do something. That's where the great improvement comes. And that's what my hope is for everybody is that 
You know, not only do they come to Travelers University and have fun, make lots of new friends. I mean, it's so easy. I mean, it's just like, like at the Passe, I mean, you had to met so many people because you're just all, you know, because we have the whole hotel. Probably going to be about 2028 20, before we get, you know, we have a big enough group in Vegas to buy out Caesar's Palace. But we're, that's the vision we're going for there. So everybody's <laughs> with us. And, but it's really it's transformational learning is what the whole goal of Trial Lawyers University is to, to get information and skills and all this stuff to, the, to folks that it'll change their lives. Because when you go from a losing trial lawyer to a winning trial lawyer or a semi-winning trial lawyer to a really big winning trial lawyer, I think like, your life is much better. And besides the money, your self-confidence, how you, how you see the world, how you see what we do, just improves so much. And that's where we're headed to, Dirk, to keep improving everything we're doing. So thanks for coming. Thanks for sharing. And I will, we'll be seeing you August 13th. I think is the date we got. Uh, I'll just be coming back. Very from good. Our, our, Thank our, you, Dan. Our, thanks, Dirk. Ready to train with the Titans and set records with your verdicts? Register for our live conferences and boot camps at triallawyersuniversity.com. Start getting your reps in before the big event by going to tluondemand.com to gain instant access to live lectures, case analysis, and skills training videos from the trial lawyer champions you love and respect, as well as pleadings, transcripts, PowerPoints, and notes for a roadmap to victory. Join the group that continues to get extraordinary results. Trial Lawyers University, produced and powered by LawPods.